Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Kim Barrett Show. I am your host, Kim Barrett. And on today's episode, we are joined by Austin Zealand. Now, if you've ever wanted to create a passive income, figure out how can you start to build an income that works without you and maybe you don't have to spend all that time in the nine to five, then this is an episode for you. Austin will break down uh, his approach, how he got started, some of the ideas he has. And uh, here's to say, it'll be a a joyous episode for you to listen to. I know myself, I was uh, excited to hear what he had to share. Now, of course, if we can ever help you with your marketing and scaling a business so you can go and invest, just head over to our free Facebook community where we have live videos, trainings every single week. That's www.joinmygroup.com.au. But until then, let's jump into the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate you making the time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here. It's great to have you. Now, I always like to start the podcast off the same way every time, which is if I met you and we were at a party and I was chatting and I said, Austin, what is it that you actually do? What's your go-to answer? You know, I usually, I try not to confuse people because truly it is kind of complicated what I do. And I try to just simplify it. I'm like, hey man, you know, like, my biggest focus is helping people transition out of nine to fives and create passive income. And so it's kind of a two part thing, but really the main focus is like separating dollars from hours. How can we make money without tying dollar or tying hours to it? Now, do you ever get weird looks and people are like, this guy's like, that sounds like something shady. It's got to be like this whole <laughs> passive income thing. Surely he's doing something dodgy. Like what's, uh, what's the normal response when you talk about passive income? Because some people, they have experience and they kind of know what's going on in the world and, digi- and digitally, they'll be like, okay, cool. That makes sense. And other people might be like, hang on, like, what do you mean passive? Like, what does that actually mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've definitely gotten that response. I wouldn't say it's an overwhelming majority. I'd say the majority of people pretty much understand what passive income is and that they have an idea of like, hey, there's at least some ways that I can make passive income. Maybe I'm not entirely aware of what they are or how they work, but I at least know that it exists. And so what I have found is that people are usually receptive and willing to listen, at least how I do it. And then they can decide like, you know, this is a little bit too risky for me. um, Or maybe I prefer doing other investment strategies. I prefer managing my own investments. Um, And so once I walk them through kind of the things that I do, it all makes sense because It's very logic based. It's not like highly speculative, I wouldn't say at least. Um, And we try to focus on physical businesses. So for example, a really popular one for us is exotic car rentals. So there are companies out there that are buying up these exotic cars and they're renting them out on a daily basis. And they're renting them out for anywhere between $1,500 and $2,000 a day. So if I look at that business and I'm like, okay, well, no matter if I invest or not, this guy is still going to be running this business. He's been doing it for, let's say, five years, and he's going to continue doing it for the next five years. So he has a well-oiled machine. He's pretty much figured out how it works. What if I was able to just buy a car and give it to him and let him manage it? So I'm just plugging into what he already has. I'm not trying to create anything new, not speculating. I already see how much money he's making. What if I could just plug into what he already has? And so then people are like, oh, that totally makes sense. So, and how did you get into that? Like, I'm sure you probably, when you were, you know, a little kid growing up, you're like, I'm going to create passive income streams and, uh, you know, go into supporting these physical businesses and doing this sort of stuff. Like what was, uh, what was the transition for you? Yeah. So, um, I would say I was at Microsoft, so I was a consultant for Microsoft. Um, I did some consulting for them and, um, at a certain point, you know, it was fun. It was great. I enjoyed it. Uh, definitely no negative experience there. It was all positive, but I really knew that I wanted to do more with my life than just work behind a desk. And I don't know if it's just due to my personality or my beliefs, um, but I I knew that I wanted to do something outside of a regular job. And so there are certain things that I'm passionate about, certain organizations that I'm involved in, and that takes up a lot of my time. And I'm like, man, if only I could figure out this whole money part where that's taken care of, I don't have to worry about making money. 
I could just focus on doing the things that I love, whether it's serving for an organization or spending time with family or whatever it is. Um, for me, that really prompted me to make that transition. And so for me, it actually started, um, I began day trading. So I started trading Forex um, and I became proficient after about a year. First year was awful, but after that, it was pretty good. Um, and so I started, you know, getting better at that. And that's when the light really like lit up for me. I'm like, oh man, like I could actually do this. This could actually legitimately replace my income. If I keep working at this, I know that I can get to the level where I can confidently leave my job and make money just doing this. And that frees up a huge chunk of my time every week. That's an extra 40, 50, 60 hours that I have. And I'm like, man, this really got me thinking. And so uh, from there, I transitioned into like automation software for trading specifically. So I created a bot that trades automatically, um, started leasing that out to clients, kind of like a subscription. Um, and then from there, it just diversified, you know, and now it's like this big portfolio where we're almost in every single industry, e-commerce, automotives, um, airplanes, yachts, uh, jewelry, anything. And how have you found, obviously, going into those types of businesses during the recent like pandemic and things like that how did that kind of affect you because you mentioned obviously you know it's um 100 not speculative but obviously there's crazy things that can go on in the world and you you know obviously you can never uh perceive what's going to happen how did that affect your um passive income strategy yeah, definitely. So um, I'm actually very thankful for what happened with the pandemic because that caused me to really get my diversification strategy on point. Um, so I was already diversified and I I would say that not all of the investments are speculative, but some definitely are. So on the speculative investments, I know what percentage of my portfolio is allocated to risky things. If I'm trying to make 100% a year, obviously it's going to carry some risk. You know, so I want to balance my portfolio in such a way where I'm protected in case something happens, but I'm also investing into the best possible route that has the highest chance of making me money. So we have two types of diversification. Number one is internal diversification. So let's say I want to have Airbnbs. I want to invest into Airbnbs. Well, I'm going to have some in Florida. I'm going to have some in Texas. I'm going to have some in maybe South Carolina, maybe another state. So within that asset class, I'm diversified internally. And I could take that a step further. I could be like, well, I'm just not, not just going to do in one city in Florida. I might do Tampa, I might do Jacksonville, maybe Miami. So a couple cities, maybe different types of properties, beachfront, uh, houses, condos, apartments. That way I'm super diversified within that sector. But then I can also diversify externally. So I'm in real estate, I'm in Airbnb, but why don't I, why, I buy an oil well down in Texas? And now I'm I'm pumping out crude oil and selling that to, to refineries. So totally unrelated industries. And that gives me enough diversification. So if something crazy does happen, I'm still protected. And um, I, I love that, by the way, because I was, I was very curious about that diversification uh, aspect from there. How, yeah. how do you now then, obviously, with the, you know, your experience over time and things like that, you mentioned like from B&Bs to exotic cars to oil wells, how do you find those opportunities now for yourself to be able to make sure that you've got that level of diversification? Yeah. So at this point, you know, early on, um, the way I started out was I literally just tried everything. So it was literally just trial and error. I'm like, oh, you do Airbnbs. Great. Let's do it. And then I started investing into everything that like generally made sense. And so what I found with that is only about maybe 60 or 70 percent of my investments were actually profitable um which you know thankfully the winners definitely outweighed the losses so i was i was net positive i was still making money but it really allowed me to refine my strategy and so at this point i'm very very specific with the things that i invest in and i only invest in the things that i really really understand how they work and i look at a 10-year time frame um as far as like hey in 10 years is this still going to be around is this still going to be making money in 10 years and if it fits my criteria i have like a whole checklist that i go through um if it fits my criteria then i pull the trigger on it um and so at this point the way i find new opportunities is actually you know i i join masterminds i join high level communities um so really it's just access and it's mostly through my network so 
I'm investing a lot of money into my network right now. So paying to be parts of groups, paying to be a part of groups that I know high level people are going to be at because those people are the ones that have access to these investment opportunities. And so I want to be there and find ways that I can add value to them. I can give them access to my investment opportunities. And a lot of times they have cool opportunities themselves uh, that we can all be a part of. And so for me, it's just relationships and networking and finding those people that I want to collaborate on, because a lot of times you could just create your own opportunities. I meet somebody that I like I like their values, I like their beliefs, and I like what they do in business. We can create an opportunity together that can then serve um, an audience. Love that. And now for the, as you you mentioned earlier, like obviously people leaving the nine to five to, and then uh, creating a passive income. Yeah. Like, how do you recommend people start? Because obviously, you know, yourself, you've got that experience over years, you've built that up and you're able to invest in, you know, like properties, vehicles, all that sort of stuff. For the the average person just starting out, like what's, what's step one for them? Um, I would say step one is finding either earning like through a, a side hustle or something, or finding some way to get some investment capital. So for a lot of people that may be something like just getting business credit. So there are business credit programs out there. Um, I can help people get funding in my program. Uh, we have investors ready to invest into deals. And so it's just a matter of getting access to funds. So being in the mindset, I would say, is step number one. So getting into that mindset of like, okay, my goal is six figures in passive income or 50K in passive income. And I want to work towards that goal. That's the first step. If your mind is in the right place, everything else will fall into order. Um, and that after that, obviously, we have to get funding. So we have to have capital to deploy into these deals. So whether that's maybe a 401k, like a retirement account, uh, maybe it's getting some sort of funding from an investor, from a bank, uh, there are other sources as well. Um, And then I'd say the most important piece of all of this is finding a mentor. So whoever it is, it has to be somebody that's created what you're looking to create. And I would say, looking back on my investment experience, if I could do it all over again, the first thing that I would do is hire a mentor because... I've met people and I've paid people a lot of money to mentor me in specific parts of my business. And every single time I do that, it's like an immediate quantum leap, like five years or 10 years ahead in that specific field. And it's crazy. Like that's one of the coolest ways that we can compress time. We can literally bring five years. So if I'm looking right now to hire a mentor, it's 2022. I can bring 2027 to my business tomorrow by hiring a mentor. And so I could wait it out. That's, you know, that's one way to do it. Or I can accelerate that and hire somebody who knows what I would only know five years from now and implement that in my business today. That's going to boost me five years ahead in my investments, my business and whatever it is. And so I would definitely double up on the mentors that I hired. um, And I would say take action quicker and take it more seriously because really it's all achievable as long as you have the right team backing you. And um, I, I love that, by the way, it's uh, wholeheartedly agree every time. It's like you can, as you said, you can wait the time and try and do it for yourself. But if you do have goals that you want to achieve in a more compressed time frame, it's, it's the only way I've been able to find to do it is to is to get the right area, whether it be you know, marketing, sales, like systems for a business yeah. or as you say like finding that right investment or like 100%. Now, if we assume that they've found a good mentor and they're looking at opportunities and things like that, you mentioned um, before about like, obviously, you know, um, the percentage rate of return on different investments is different for someone looking to build that passive income. Is there a category that like passed a certain percentage? Like, yeah, I think you said like, oh, if you were going hundred percent in a year, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like what is a, a rate of return that people, when they're looking at investments, and I know this is not investment advice, this is not anything like that. Is there a, is there a realm where it enters where people should be like, that's, you know, so it, it is actually too good to be true because obviously once you start looking at um, investments, investment programs, mentors, that I'm sure there's some like with every industry that are probably you know like you know, promising the world and delivering an atlas type of thing. <laughs> that's funny, promising the world, delivering an atlas. That's kind of funny. Um, you know, I would say it really depends because even going back to the example that I showed you earlier about the exotic cars, like 
in reality, you can make a massive, massive return on that. And the reason that we can do that is because of leverage. So let's say you wanted to go out and you wanted to buy like a Rolls Royce or a Ferrari or Lamborghini, something like that. A lot of times, depending on your credit, obviously, but you can get into one of these cars with like 20 or 30K down. So let's say you paid 30K to get in on this car. Now you give it to a car rental company and they're renting it out and making, let's say, just 20K a month. And let's say they're splitting those profits with you 50-50. Well, now you're bringing in 10K a month. Over 12 months, that's 120,000. You're in only 30K. So you made a 400% return. So is it realistic? Yeah, definitely. I think it's definitely realistic. Now, if you're investing into something like an Airbnb, or maybe you're buying a house and expecting to make 400% return, uh, it's probably not going to happen, you know, or somebody messages you on Instagram and they're like, hey, buy my new NFT. It's going to make you 400% returns. That's also probably not going to happen. So you really have to like analyze, like, is the math really there? And does it make sense why I would make 200, 300, 400% returns? Because truly to make a 400% return on an exotic car rental is very, very simple. And it's nothing out of the ordinary. If somebody made 400, 500%, I'd be like, yeah. That sounds about right. You know what I mean? So it really depends highly on the investment itself. Um, I wouldn't use just a percentage as a guideline. I would look at the business model itself and what it is that we're investing into because those returns exist, but they're not publicly available. So it's all about access in the investment game, access to education and access to these investment opportunities. Because if I can introduce you to the guy that's running my exotic car rentals, you can make 400% this next year, right? But I've spent years developing that relationship and making sure that we're on good terms where I can send my uh, my students his way so that we have that built out. And it's not a guessing game. They don't have to figure anything out. It's just plug and play. And like with uh, opportunities and things like that, I'm just also curious just on like a, uh, a heat temperature of the market in the US versus Australia. How are you kind of adjusting your investment strategies, being that everyone's, you know, adding that's like uh, in a recession or heading into a recession and all this sort of like, you know, global financial turmoil that seems to be um, at least batted in the media anyway. How, what's your kind of finger on the pulse that you're, you're seeing over in the US at the moment? Yeah. So I definitely think that we're, uh, the, the current state of the economy is recession like. Um, and I would say that my investment strategy has shifted just a little bit. Um, I still understand the main risks of what I'm investing into. And like I mentioned earlier, I started out with Forex and Forex trading and software. So about half of my net worth always stays in my trading software. And so I use that as like a core of my investment strategy. And then I add everything on top of that because I understand how that works. Everything else is like, okay, let's, let's diversify, but the core is always going to be Forex. So for me, the way I've changed these little add-on investments is I've shifted more into physical assets. So I'm really focused on like, hey, if I if I go out and I buy a Lamborghini and inflation doubles, well, guess what? My car is just going to double in value because that asset is worth something and it's going to be worth something today and it's going to be worth something in the next few years. Whatever the dollar is worth, it's usually going to carry that value with it. So I'll able to store that amount of value that I have within that vehicle, or maybe within a house, or maybe a gold watch, or maybe a private jet or a yacht, whatever it is, I'm shifting more towards physical assets because of the anti-inflationary uh, protection that it provides. And besides that, it's cash flowing for me. So um, I've really started shifting towards physical assets. Um, and I'd say that that's a pretty safe bet in a market like this. Um, and if we look at the, the history of even real estate, it tends to always go up. So even if I'm not like completely on point and I buy at the very top of the market and it goes down, it's probably going to keep going higher in the future. So it's a matter of time in the market, not timing the market. Because you mentioned at the very beginning, right? It's like when you're looking at these, it's like a 10-year time horizon that you're assessing things on, not like, oh, what's going to happen tomorrow or next, even next year. Yeah. Like if I go out and I buy a house, any house you look at right now, what are the chances that it's going to be less expensive in 10 years as opposed to more expensive? Well, probably zero. My guess is it's going to be more expensive. No matter what house you're looking at right now in 10 years, it's probably going to be worth more than what it is today. 
And whether that's due to the decline of the purchasing power of a currency or whatever other economic factors, it's probably going to be worth more of whatever currency we're using at that point in 10 years. Yeah, awesome. Love that. And now, Austin, as we get towards the end of our time here together, I do like to ask the same question every time at the end of the podcast, which is, is there a question which I haven't asked you yet that I should have? Hmm. That's a pretty interesting question. Um, I would say, you know, one question that I would have asked me is, how do I see electric vehicles playing into the future? So that's one question that seems to be on the mind of a lot of investors. As we see a shift towards renewable energy, that's a really interesting field for me. So with electric vehicles, we have to understand the core of our economy, at least in the US, is largely based on petroleum and crude oil and all that. And it's really, really involved with um, that whole industry. So everything, that's kind of like the backbone of the United States economy at this point. So in order to make, to make that transition, we have to think about what would it really take? And so if we want to transition away from oil and away from gas and gas powered vehicles, we need to have some sort of drastic actions that are happening in the United States and globally as well to, number one, shrink that um, industry as a whole and then enlarge the renewable ener energy industry. Um, and a lot of people ask me, like, hey, do you think this is going to happen within the next five years or 10 years or 20 years? Um, and truthfully, I don't think so. I think we're definitely headed in that direction. And I think everything that's related to renewable energy is an extremely, extremely good um, opportunity for us. Um, and I'm heavily invested into certain industries in the renewable energy and electric vehicles and all that, because I believe it's just going to grow. In 10 years, are we going to have more electric vehicles or less? You know, so back to that 10 year rule, probably more. We're probably going to have a new model of Tesla and probably going to have self-driving semi trucks and stuff like that. So as an industry, it's growing as an industry, oil and gas is shrinking. But we have a very unique situation right now, at least in the US. I'm not sure how it is in Australia, where gas prices are skyrocketing. Um, and so they're the highest that, you know, at least I've seen in my life. And with that, what are the factors affecting that? And these companies that are selling this gas, they want to keep prices high. So is that beginning to drive more people towards renewable energy? I believe so. People are now maybe considering electric vehicles, people who haven't previously, they're now like, oh, you know what? A Prius is not that bad. Maybe, maybe I want a Tesla after all. Um, so we're really, really spurring that whole movement um, while the oil and gas industry is dying down a little bit. Do I think it's going to happen within the next 10, 20 years? I don't really think so. Um, I think it's going to be around for a while, but that's definitely something to keep an eye on. So in whatever capacity you can take part in that industry um, and potentially maybe even make an investment that uh, is linked to a company that's maybe developing renewable energy technology, that's definitely a sector that I'm looking at. And I don't see it being affected by recession or by certain economic factors because it's such a macro move that's happening. Mm, awesome. I love that. So guys, if you're listening, definitely check that out. And now Austin, for anyone, if they're listening and they said, great, like I really like what um, Austin shared, what it sounds like he's up to and um, his approach to investing, where's the best place for people to see what you're up to online? Yeah. So I actually, I use Instagram as like my landing page. I do have a landing page, but Instagram is my landing page. So it's Austin Zellin, um, just my name, first and last name. Um, and I basically post everything. So all the investments that I'm doing, um, sometimes I post about cool investment ideas that people um, can try out if they'd like to. Um, and all the information about my program and stuff like that is on there as well. So definitely Instagram. I use it as like a central hub for everything. Beautiful. Love that. So guys, wherever you're watching or listening to this, check the show notes and we'll have a link to uh, Austin's IG profile on there as well. And if you know anyone that maybe they're in nine to five, they've been talking about starting to build up passive income please do share this episode with them so they can get a little bit of Austin's wisdom in their ears as well. And Austin, again, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you making the time. Yeah. Thank you for having me, man. Appreciate you.